<laughs> okay. All right. Hello, this is Rashim, uh, the host of The Counter Narrative. Right now, I'm on the phone with one of our special guests. <laughs> I hear her laughing on the phone in the background. And um, we're just right now just really trying to make sure that we get her connected. So tonight's episode is called Orange is Not the New Black. It is on race, race, gender, and incarceration. And I really wanted to make sure that I get these uh, women to kind of share their story, share their background, and talk about some of the things that they have been through and experienced. And as long as all of the technical difficulties and bugs worked out, work out, we'll have an opportunity to hear from them. So before we get super deep into it and they come on, I am going to just share a quote from Michelle Alexander. Michelle Alexander wrote a book called The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, which is a very, I think, provocative book, very good book. And it basically talks about the judicial um, system and the way that um, incarceration sentences are given out. And it is uh, she asserts that it is not a color a colorblind system, um, and our guests have had various experience with this particular topic. Whether it's they have been themselves uh, in a situation where they have been incarcerated, or they counsel people, as well as um, they have been um, incarcerated. So they're going to share some of their experiences. So Michelle Alexander says, arguably the most important parallel between mass incarceration and Jim Crow is that both have served to define the meaning and significance of race in America. Indeed, a primary function of any race, racial caste system is to define the meaning of race in its time Slavery defined what it meant to be black as a slave. Jim Crow defined what it meant to be black as a second class citizen. Today, mass incarceration defines the meaning of blackness in America. Black people, especially black men, are criminals. That is what it means to be black. And then there's also an article that I that I have shared. And if you're watching the replay, then I would say go ahead and check this out. The article uh, or in slash video was Jay Z's War on Drugs as an Epic Fail. And that's particularly interesting because it shares some of the same standpoints as the Michelle Alexander uh, book, The New Jim Crow, where it talks about the judicial system and that basically it's not a color colorblind system. What I mainly want to talk about with our guests as they, when they come on is their personal lived experiences, their perspectives, how they transition from um, being incarcerated to being a returning citizen. Uh, we're also going to talk about ways that if you have a loved one, a family member who has been incarcerated, what are some of the ways that we can support them in their transition? What are some of the ways that we can um, also not just support them in their transition um, with tangible things, but like what type of some emotional support? What are some of the things that, that they need to help them to better adjust? And all of our guests have some particular experience with that, which is one of the reasons that I'm very excited about making sure that I get them on. And we're still having a bit of technical um, blunders here at the moment. So I am going to try to pull them on as they come in and they can talk about their personal lived experiences. And um, and we can go deeper into that. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to please put the questions in the chat if you are here watching us live. If you're not here watching us live, feel free to put a comment under the video in YouTube. Um, you can always find us here at um, on firetalk.com forward slash Rasheem. You can also catch these replays at, excuse me, uh, shavillarasheem.com. You can always catch me on Twitter at S Rasheem, and that's spelled uh, at symbol, <laughs> S-R-A-S-H-E-E-M. And on Facebook, I am Rasheem Rasheem. So I am going to click over again to try to see if we can very quickly get our guests in. Still having, uh-oh, 
still having a little challenges uh, with getting our guests on, but we are not quitters. So uh, we're going to see how that works out. Now, the book that I was mentioning earlier is looks like this. I know it got a, it has a little bit of a glare, and this is the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. I have it in this funk in this format, and I also have it on my um, Kindle. Um, so let's see, Elizabeth, if you're still here, George recommends that you try your phone, try to connect through your phone, or if you have another device to connect through, then try to use that as a means of connection for the show. And again, you are tuned in to uh, the counter narrative. Tonight's segment is Orange is Not the New Black, and we will be talking about race, gender, and incarceration with three of our uh, panelists who are Black women who have some experience with incarceration, whether it's they are drug addiction specialists within uh, the judicial system or specifically within a woman's prison, or if they have been in prison or incarcerated at some point in the past and now they are returning citizens and what was that experience like? How, there's another woman who will be joining us shortly, fingers crossed, should all the technology works out, who she just recently had a summit, um, re-entry summit. And one another thing that I want us to be able to talk about is reducing the, recidiv the recidivism rate, which recidivism is just basically the amount or the number of times a person actually returns back to prison or to jail. What is the likelihood? Um, how is the system set up to make sure that people are not you know, repeat offenders? And what are some of the factors and the conditions that leads to a person repeating? Um, I, one of Some of the things that I've heard of is they cannot find a job. Uh, employment is really tough. And so when employment is tough, you tend to take alternative routes. If you can't get employment, you tend to take alternative routes to be able to feed your family and take care of yourself because all of those are very real very, very real needs, very real concerns that are unavoidable. And again, this is uh, the counter narrative. Tonight's show is Orange is Not the New Black, and it is on race, gender, and incarceration. And I am working on getting our guests in. The book that I referenced earlier, again, was Jim Crow, uh, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And I also re reference. Um, an article or a section that was written in the New York Times. It's also a video, it's a very short video. Um, and it's called Jay-Z's War on Drugs is an Epic Fail. If you are here watching us live, you can kind of actually scroll under the video section and it will give you the link. I put the link there. And also if you're here, I also added the link to the first chapter of this book. If you want to check out the first chapter of this particular book. Um, the Forward is written by Cornell West and he gives it rave reviews, naturally. And a forward, that's what you would expect. <laughs> um, and she talks about, uh, in this book, she starts talking about um, caste system and how the judicial system helps to set up a caste system. Um, what that, how that has traditionally played out um, she also talks about the role that racism plays in some of these systems in terms of saying or identifying that um, racism necessarily does not disappear with different generations. What it does is kind of change form. It's a very resilient ideology. And what happens is it tends to take on a new form. And so we don't recognize it because it's, it has a different uh, a different outfit, so to speak. So slavery is uh, different from Jim Crow, which is different from um, civil rights, which is different from judicial system, which is different from um, today. Yay, oh, you are on for a second. Um, so all of those things play a factor and she kind of lays that out a lot in, in um, her book. So if you are one of our guests and you are still trying to get on um, and you haven't been able to get on a few things to check out, try Google 
Chrome is a better connection. And the next best I heard is Firefox. Right now, Natiri, I'm trying to let you on. So I click to let you on, but you have to accept in order to connect. Um, if your laptops and computers are typically optimal for this connection, however, if your laptop or your computer is not working, then we can try your phone if that works. Um, phones are not my primary choice, but we could try that as a device or if you have a Kindle or a iPhone, really anything that can get internet, internet access and a camera uh, works pretty good. So right now I am still trying to get uh, our guest on. Looks like Natira might be able to get on. Okay, your screen is black. Could you say something? Say hello. 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 How are you doing? All right. So we can't see you only just because it's dark, but we can hear you, which is awesome sauce. Um, and you'll probably be at a location shortly where we can actually see your face. Um, our other guest is still trying to you know, get on and I believe, yeah, the other two are just still trying to get on. So I'll go ahead and start with you if that's okay. okay How do you okay. feel? That sound good? Okay, so I, I, I just want to start with these things. So tell us your name. What is your relationship to this particular topic? And tell us something that you are passionate about. Okay, so my name is Natira Mickey. My relationship to this particular topic is that I um, was previously incarcerated. Um, and so it's really sensitive and close to my heart. Um, and I have faced firsthand um, the tremendous uh, barrier it is to transition back from, you know, I mean, back into society from incarceration. So um, basically, that's what has been interested in this topic and what's in this subject. And Thank you. Um, also, Natira, tell us something about you that we can't find out from your bio. Um, so I guess one, one thing about me, um, I'm just very, uh, I guess I'm worn. I'm a visionary. I, I think outside of the box. And um, I see things that look impossible to others as possible. That you can't You talked a little bit earlier about knowing firsthand about the difficulty in terms of transition. Can you talk a, about transitioning? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Okay, so just a little bit of, in reference to that, just the fact of um, yeah. from a female's perspective, a female's point of view, um, <laughs> what dealing with the criminal justice system and how it has been set up and all those things. Um, and how a lot of the services and, and a lot of the things that have been put in place to service individuals who have been incarcerated was mainly geared to males um, in the earlier times because males were uh, basically, yeah, I mean, it was higher numbers of males being incarcerated. So now that the numbers are changing and women are um, the actual, uh their, their numbers and rates are increasing, increasing. It's not enough services out here for them. So once I, you know, was a couple times incarcerated and different things like that, um, when I came back out to try to get the into society, I was faced with a lot of different challenges. Um, I was faced with um, challenges um, in various employment, housing, and of course I was a single mother. So that really, uh, made it even more difficult a lot of the services that they had available for individuals who were low income unavailable to me because of the background at that time. And it was certain things that were put in place. So it was just a lot of diff different roles I, I, for everything that I tried. When I tried to get into college, I had to go through an extensive process of that and everything. So dealing with the emotional strain of being incarcerated and then from a kind of like a uh, a place where you are being kind of socialized in the sense to act and, 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 and live a certain kind of way, um, that was really um, challenging. And so once, I mean, through that process, you know, I had a lot of ups and downs, and I really had to take strength that I never even knew I had to make it. 
So that's why I'm so interested in this subject because I want to assist other people who um, have been incarcerated, who actually have, um, you know, gotten out and, and are trying to turn their lives around and do something different. I want to assist them in doing that because when I was there, I needed a helping hand, but it, was no, it wasn't one to be found. So um, basically... Just the, just the trouble and all, and then also just being a single mother and having a transition not only back so that I can provide for my family, but also to be able to provide for her emotionally as well. And so that whole situation was like a little off as well. So all of that stuff. Right. No, thank you for that. So um, I'm going to go to um, Elizabeth in a moment. But Natira, when, when um. When you're talking, could you hold the like put the camera down or set it up on something? It's shaking a little bit as you talk. Okay. Um, so um Elizabeth, welcome. We they're trying to get you on and now you're on. I feel like I want to do a little cabbage patch now. Okay. Uh so glad to have you. Please tell us uh who you are, your relationship to the topic, and tell us something that you're passionate about. Okay, my name is Elizabeth Adivac, and I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm a drug and alcohol counselor, and I'm passionate about seeing women's lives change. I'm a drug and alcohol counselor. I've been doing that now for about 15 or 16 years, and the majority of my clients are incarcerated. So it's about trying to give them the skills that they need so that when they come home, they don't have to go back into the system. Absolutely. And can you tell us something about you that we can't find out from a bio? Well, I, I, I will tell you something about me is that I am a recovering alcoholic myself. And it's through God's grace and mercy that that's no longer an issue that I have to deal with. But all of us are in recovery from something. If not drugs, alcohol, other issues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When you, um, you, you talk about your experience a little bit with drug and alcohol, and now you're in a position where you're able to serve others and help them to to make that transition through you know basically kind of like healing uh, a healing process tell me a little bit about the relationship between drug and alcohol abuse and incarceration how does that go hand in hand how do they do they enable each other are they, is that a, a relationship what does that look like that is a very strong relationship between drugs and alcohol because you find out that the majority of the women that are incarcerated have issues with drugs and alcohol. And a lot of times, the using the substance is a crutch because it's another deep hurt. So many of my clients that I deal with, like me, are victims of sexual assault, and they never told no one that. So they end up turning to drugs and alcohol as a means of escape. Absolutely. I could definitely see that. And then if you're in a situation, I'm guessing, where you're trying to self-medicate through the hurts. Um, and then if you have some of the challenges like what Natira uh, mentioned earlier in terms of employment cha challenges, housing challenges, like those are all like things that could stress you out. That's a, like a huge emotional stress. Natira, I don't want you to feel like you need to look at the camera at all because I see that you're driving. Okay. Yeah, okay. No, somebody's holding it in a passenger. Okay. Don't, don't. I'm, driving, I'm not going to look at the camera at all. I'm not going to look at I'm looking at the road. I'm listening, though. You're on the hands-free, so I can hear you in the car. Okay. So, yeah, I'm driving. Good deal. Good deal. Okay. Yeah, I'm driving. 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 Yeah, I'm I guess you could say some of the biggest misconceptions about women who have been incarcerated is that they are not they they are not worthy or they are not uh i guess in a sense um worthy is a, is a good term that i can use they are not worthy of, of of assistance or or help or they or they are worthless in a sense because after you are released and you have to deal with all of that stuff it gets to a point where so that's how you begin to feel because that's how the system treats you. So I think that that's one of the biggest misconceptions because they forget that although that's just one of the many, um, that's one of my many traits. That's just a, 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 somewhere that I've stopped along my way. That doesn't define me. So just basically defining an individual by their experience 
free or by a mistake because we all have made mistakes. We just haven't all been caught for them. And that's always been my motto because everybody, no one is perfect. So sometimes we put, we as women, you know, we put, and people in general, put ourselves in situations where we, you know, make mistakes. And we have to suffer the consequences. However, we shouldn't have to suffer forever. So once we come out, and now you have people looking down on you, looking down on your skill level because you have a criminal background. They want to pay you less money. They want to they want to um, relocate you in neighborhoods that are, you know, really not safe for your children and, and, you know, raising your families and different things like that. So just the fact that, you know, we cannot be rehabilitated or we are not worthy of being rehabilitated is one of the things that I think I will say. Misconception. Yeah, I definitely appreciate you sharing that because to me, what that says a lot too is like uh, worthy and unworthy poor. Who deserves assistance? Who deserves help? And we and we do make those decisions when we're like, you know, even in help in helping professions as social workers. I'm a so, I'm a social worker. As social workers, we decide who is worthy to be helped and who's not worthy to be helped. Who deserves yeah. our money and who doesn't deserve? And I and I can see the stigma that's associated with having been incarcerated because you made a mistake and then it's like you have to pay for the rest of your life because of you can't live in a particular place. And then if you're only able to live, let's say in high crime, high drug areas, then you're likely to repeat whatever got you there in the first place. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And, and I'm sorry. No, go ahead. And definitely even dealing with that, you know, basically, you know, being in those same living situations and in those, you know, in those environments and having all of those, those, those doors slammed in your face over and over and over again, because I'm telling you, it was by the grace that I was able to make it because I almost gave up and co completely gave up. I almost lost my mind going through that transition and trying to do something different with myself. And sometimes pe everybody does not have that extra, um, that extra, that extra up to, to put into it. And that's why it's easy for a person to go back. And that's why the recidivism rate is so high. Because of how the system is, it's a systematic error. You know, it's, it, it, and so policies and different things like that need to be put in place. They need to be changed and put in favor of individuals who have, you know, been, well, I'm not going to say victimized because you did something, but who have suffered, you know, and, and, and went through this type of situation in foster Mm, thank you for that. Elizabeth, can you speak a little bit to um, how some of the people who have experienced some of the trauma that Natira is talking about go to, how they, how are they before being incarcerated? Like if, if when you hear the story of their life, where did drugs start to show up the heaviest? Um, in their, in their journey, how much of drug use is coping for whatever their situation is? The majority of the clients that I deal with, especially because I work in the women's prison now, the drug substance started early, very early in their lives, early, you know, because I, I can even talk about my own self from being uh, molested as a child. I started using substances probably you know, in my 18s or 19s, but if if you don't, if you're feeling hopeless, the majority of them probably start anywhere maybe from 14 on up because I don't feel loved, I don't feel accepted, so it's easier to use drugs as a means of escape. And so, what are some of the things that? Because you work in a in a um, correctional facility. Yes, I do. So, what are some of the things that are set up that help them to? not go back to drugs once they get out? Well, one of the things that they do is like they help them, um, you know, get birth certificate. I mean, like if they need a social security card, they have classes where they can learn how to write resumes. They can get their GEDs. They can even do training uh, for to do work in a restaurant, like doing safe serve. Uh, they can also become a licensed beautician. They can take computer classes. Uh, college classes and different things like that and get their GED those are while all they're incarcerated there. Those are all good. Tell me about, so you talked a little bit about uh, some of the drug use from like early, early childhood trauma that, you know, that already just 
puts them in a different space, a different mindset. And you're making decisions based on the resources and information that you have at that time. Like I was molested. I went through this. This is this is something that's going to help me cope and, and deal with. Mm -hmm. what, what is the drug like? What is the drug use like in jail? Do, do, do they have access to drug use? Is it easy? Is it what is that like? You know, it's always there because when I first started doing drug and alcohol counseling, I didn't think, you know, I thought, oh, well, when they're incarcerated, they're clean. But they believe me, it's there, too. So some of them have to make a choice not to use it. But it's there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Natira mentioned earlier is um, the emotional strain. Yes. What is the biggest emotional strain that you find people are trying to medicate for? A lot of them are medicating. Okay, I, I'm like you. I'm a social worker. So many of them are not properly diagnosed. So you're dealing with women who have depression, bipolar. Uh -oh. uh, no one never really talks about in the prison how many of those women there really need being incarcerated is not the answer. They need more psychological help and mental health services. They're not getting those services. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, I definitely agree with that, um, that basically the, the issue is deeper than the, the substances, basically. It, it, it's a, it's a deep-rooted issue and it's rooted in trauma. And so, you know, and then to be re-traumatized within that system as well is um, kind of, you know, because that's basically what's, what's going on. You're being re-traumatized. Right. You've already been traumatized. You committed these acts, that trauma, and now you're being drawn into a system that is now re-traumatizing you. And, you know, so now you're kind of like even more worse off than you were beforehand. So instead of really targeting the issue, you're kind of like just putting a band-aid on it. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like what, like from you, you guys' ex personal experience and everything that you've observed, it sounds like it's really more mental mental illness, mental health issues that should be addressed be beyond or outside of just putting a person away because that's not. Yeah. And that's true because I'm telling you, so many of them that have some serious mental health issues and they closed down a lot of the state institution that was serving people with these issues. And the only other answer is to lock them up and throw the key away. But that's not really helping them with their problems. Then you put them back out on the streets. Housing is an issue. Okay, I don't have proper housing. I don't, you know. Now I've got to live on the streets. How am I going to provide for myself? So I'm going to turn back and do what I always did, which is the easy escape of using the drugs. Yeah. What are some of the things that you mentioned? Some of the things that are that are offered in the uh, in the correctional facility where you work in terms of GED classes and um, training, or, or some of the other things that you mentioned. What have you found has been the most helpful in helping the helping women not to recidivate or helping women to even heal? Because sometimes I, I think a lot of times we think we just need to get people a job and that's going to fix everything. <laughs> <laughs> and no, that, just getting somebody a job. This is an issue that even before I started doing <clears throat> drug and alcohol counseling that I was passionate about was getting people mental health services, talking about the issues that cause them to be incarcerated in the first place. And I just feel like we live in a society where we want people to go to prison and think when you get out, you're supposed to be well, and you're not gonna re you know, go back to prison or anything. But if you don't have the services you need, when you get out, you can go right back in again. <coughs> What are some of the things? Okay, go ahead. And then it becomes a revolving door. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of the um, the policies that that do help, or what are some of the things that do help once the once people get out? Like, what helped you in your situation to, you know, to just kind of move on and to heal and to what helps? 
you know, and I guess for me, when I can talk about me, what helped was I had a lot of friends that were there to encourage and support me. And because I'm so passionate about what I'm doing, I want to see women heal. What I did was I went out and I started, you know, a, a woman's organization where not a big organization, but we're, you know, we're out there on the forefront and we talk about issues that are important to women. Like every year we do a campaign on sexual assault. I just had an event last week that was talking about recovery and woman recovery. So I try to keep those type of issues out there because I'm, I'm a real believer in that the only time you should look down on a sister is when you're extending a hand to help her up. Amen to that. So one, I keep hearing some of the, it's like some of these things that sounds like they're very thematic in terms of like they're coming up in relation to incarceration. So, mm -hmm. And drug abuse. Are they like, yes. are like oh, in terms of like percentages, what will you say are the number of women that you've had in con been in contact with that have been incarcerated that has either been, either been sexually assaulted or had previous experience with abusing drugs? You know, I have to say something because all of my clients, they are in that issue. I say the majority of the women who are incarcerated have some type of issue with drugs or alcohol that happened before they got there. Right, before they ha before they got there. Because you find out is that a lot of time when women are incarcerated, it's more for petty crimes. Tell me more about that. What are the, with the women that you have worked with, what are the typical crimes that you see that they're actually incarcerated for? Uh, shoplifting, boosting, uh, drug, you know, having, you know, selling drugs or prostitution. You know, uh, I'm trying to think about that. That's probably, and now you're seeing some of them who are in there for more serious crime, but the majority of their crimes aren't that serious. But the, the biggest problem with so many of them is that they don't have their, they don't have good education. So they have difficulty getting a job. So it just seemed like everything is marked against them. And when they're feeling low, down, and discouraged, they go back and do what they always did. Then another thing is that so many of these women have been in abusive relationships. So they'll go right back out and get in one abusive relationship to another relationship because they don't know what a healthy relationship looks like. And what are these? So you mentioned that a lot of them are there for like petty crimes or like, you know, smaller things. Are the, the women at, at the place where you uh, where you work, are they there for any particular significant amount of time? Like, what is the average sentence on some of these crimes? You know, what, whether it's what I run against now in the criminal justice system, women are getting more and more time. I mean, because it's not uncommon to see a woman do eight years or more in prison now. So where I'm at, you have the one that they're, they're getting more stiffer sentences, so they're spending more time incarcerated much more time because on the average my clients they have to be down to 18 months of uh, have 18 months left of their time before they're eligible to be eligible for our program so some of them have been locked up for years i mean even there's some because my minds is more it's kind of funny we have women there that have been locked up for over 30 some years wow yeah Wow, no, that's quite huge. Um, I'm really curious to know, and I was to get Kira back on. Uh -oh. Sorry, I'm also Facebooking live, so say hello to Facebook Live. Facebook Live, if you want to catch, if you want to catch this live and participate in the conversation, go to firetalk.com forward slash Rasheem. Firetalk.com forward slash Rasheem, and then you'll be able to catch catch where the show is actually right now. All right. And for everyone who just recently tuned in, you are watching the counter narrative. This is this episode is Orange is not the new black. And we are talking about race, gender and incarceration. Thank you, Steph, for being here. George, thank you for being here, even in the pre-show. Tia, thank you for joining us. Elizabeth, who's on camera. Thank you also. And thank you also, Dante. One of the things I want to ask you about, Elizabeth, is a lot of these women I'm imagining at the very least are mothers. 
Yes. And so they're going away for six. I mean, like, I, I don't even have to say years, really. Like, even if you're going away for one year and some months, for 18 months, that is a long time for a mother to be away from her children. What is that like? And what what is that conversation like? What comes up for them uh, when you talk about their children and their family? You know, their children are very sensitive to them. And because in fact, I meant to look it up, but I remember when uh, George, uh, when Clinton was in office, because there's a lady there that uh, she's been gone. I'm, I'm not sure how long she's been gone away, but she's upset because she wasn't married to the man that she was living with. So since he wasn't her child's father, this child had to go into foster care. So that is really hard for her to have to deal with. And, you know, I never really paid that issue no attention until I heard her say that one day. Talking about she said, because she's really upset because she wants to be reunified with her daughter. But right now, because she's been gone out of her child's life for two years, that child was put into the foster care system. Wow. So a mm -hmm. lot of times. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like it's this it's a, a very cyclical thing in terms of, OK, something traumatic happens to me. I self-medicate by drug addiction or abuse. I go to jail. I have children. My children are now into the foster system, which increases the chances from all the studies that I've seen in terms of them being sexually assaulted, them using drugs. And it's just like this on sounds like it could be like this ongoing thing. Um, how, so how do they, like when, when they transition from in the services that you provide, they've been medicating themselves. There, there may be some mental illness there that is not being addressed. They've been misdiagnosed or not diagnosed. So they're not really getting the treatment that they need. And so they come to sessions with you, but they've been uh, self-medicating all this time what do they do? What tools and coping me mechanisms do you give them to cope without substance? Well, you know what? We talk a lot about getting them to love on the reflection in the mirror. We, you know, we, we try to give them coping skills by different, different tools and different things that they can use when they get outside. Because I always tell them when they leave that they need to be going to meetings, get a sponsor. That is so important to have a sponsor to help keep them on the right track. Having someone that they can be accountable to and talk to when they're going through something so that they don't feel out alone. Because I think that's a lot of time why so many of them recidivate is they don't, they, you know, they're going back to that old neighborhood. You know, the drugs is there. Well, if, and I'm feeling really down and bad. I'm going to go back and do what I always do. But if I've got somebody I can call on the phone and talk to, Hey, that might be just what I need that moment to stop me from going out there using. You bring up a really good point. Can you tell us, uh, some of us, in terms of if we have family members who are incarcerated and who are getting ready to be released and about to be returning citizens, how can we help them transition better? You know, what? I think how we can help them transition better is don't make excuses for them. Be real with them. And also try to find out about the, the disease of addiction. It is a disease, and we need to stop trying to rescue our family members. You know, hold them accountable for their actions. But also, but you know what? Love on them because I think they need so much love because I get so mad sometimes. You know, an addict to another addict, their record, they will, when they'll welcome them back when they come home. But sometimes I'm like, okay, where the church is at when these people are getting released from prison? Some of these are members of your church. Why aren't we on that same bandwagon welcoming them, welcoming them back when they come home? Absolutely. I totally agree. Do you feel like because this particular topic is about race, gender and incarceration. Do you feel like there are specific needs that women who have been incarcerated need? Yeah, they, they do. They're, they, women in particular, they have more need. I, you know, I don't want to say that they have more need than men because they don't, but women, they do have some needs that they really do have a lot more needs 
to be met, like especially when I'm talking about the mental health issue. Because when that woman's been down for any length of time, that's affected her self-esteem, how she feels about herself and everything. Mm -hmm. So how would you, how would our approach, let's say to a sister be in terms of ways that we could help her that you think might be different from how we might interact with the guy, with the man? You know what, I guess to me, it's just when that woman comes back, being there, just having a, you know, sometimes having a sister friend. You know how important that is? Just to have that sister friend that I can talk to, that can encourage me, motivate me, sit in her cars, just spending time doing things with her. Because, like, you know, a lot of time what I do with my organization is I go out to um, different shelters where women at and just provide them with encouragement and support. Like, you can do this. I believe in you, but then also I'm going to be frank and real with them because, like I'm telling you, I ain't going to sugarcoat it. I ain't going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you like it is because I feel like if I sugarcoat you, I'm going to hurt you more. Right. Absolutely. So it's kind of like kind of like tough love, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Tough love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there are there particular um, drugs or experiences or time period for which it seems like it's harder to come back from? When you-, you know, it's kind of funny right now. And then, well, I think it is naturally everywhere. You know, uh, one that I really don't think I, I kind of laugh. Even now, you know, in our presidential election, no, none of them is really talking about drug academic. Now, our president has said something about heroin. Heroin is really bad out there on the streets. In Indianapolis, is a big concern because in Indianapolis, most places, you have more people that are overdosing off of heroin right now because they're putting other things into it. And the, and I'm a big proponent about the pain pills. No, nobody looks at that. You know, so many of our people are medicating off of pain pills, the Vicodin, you know, all of them trying to find an escape. Right. All of it is like, it sounds like a lot of it is around escaping pain, escaping hurt. Mm-hmm. That I don't, I mean, it's like, I don't want to feel nothing. I want to feel numb. Right. No, I totally get that. One of the things um, Natira mentioned is that there's not enough services once they get out. No, there's not. What type of services would you would you recommend there be that could that could be a good support? You know what? To me, I this is something I eventually I would love to see my organization do is is like when these women come home, they need to have a place where they can go, they can have meetings, uh, where they can you. Know, uh, where they can have medical care, just a one-stop shopping approach where you get everything met in one place. So, like, get their medical needs met, also have, like, some sort of sisterhood accountability location. Where they- sisterhood accountability, where they can take, like, GED classes. You know, just basic, simple stuff that we don't think is important. It's like cooking a meal, you know, how do I shop? You know, so many of them, if, if no one's never told me that before, I don't know how to go to the grocery store shop. Mm-hmm. You know, just simple, basic stuff that these women need. Mm-hmm. No, that's interesting. Like how to grocery shop, that definitely would not have been something uh, that would have came to my mind right off. But no, I mean, it's good. It's good to know it's a good, good thing. Because, you know, what? if you think about it, when they get their food stamps, they... They don't know how to spend their money, you know, so it's it just going to the store. Okay, hey, this, so let's make these food stamps last for a month. Like managing resources, basically. You're right. Like, how do I make this stretch to the end of the... Right. How, how we talked a little bit about motherhood. Do they typically end up getting their children back when they get out? What is that? Stop. You know what? Now, when it comes to children, I'm not real good, but some of them do. But then some of them also could lose their children too, because they go, they go right back out there to the same lifestyle, doing the same thing again. So then they get wrapped up in the system. So, like I know, I've seen it where I worked at before. What these sisters have done was they've got incarcerated, and while they were incarcerated, the children were put in child protective services. But in order to get back the child, there's so many conditions that you have to meet. 
And I'm not trying to be funny. If you child protective services, if you're a black woman, they don't we got some special needs and what some white sisters might have different needs. Mm -hmm. Uh one of the uh members of the chat room, Stephanie, says my sister has been incarcerated twice, one time as a juvenile and one time as an adult. She is currently serving 18 months probation for assaulting me. She has a few mental health issues that she refuses to get help for. I'm really scared for her. My sister lost custody of her daughter because of her crimes. This is like a big wow. deal. It's like breaking up families, but it's a thing where it seems like there's this congruous relationship between sexual assault, drug abuse, and incarceration. And I don't think people really understand is that as being black, we fear the mental health system because I'm afraid that you're going <clears> to... <throat> put this label on me that I can't get off of me. So then if so then if I fear the mental health services, I'm not going to take the medicine because sometimes the medicine that you have to take for like say if you got bipolar or depression can have so many negative side effects you don't want to take it. So I read to self medicate and take the medicine that I'm pres that I'm prescribed. Right. I, one of the things I, I will say that I've noticed just in general with the medical system and people of color is there's just a there's just a general cultural mistrust. And I don't. Right. Think, and in general, I don't think I know that it doesn't come from any there's come out of thin air. I know that there's been Tuskegee experiments. There's been um, the whole reason why we have OBGYN is because uh men practice on uh, the female slaves to learn about the anatomy and um, gave them. So I know that there is a history in this country of using black people as um, science experiments and injecting them with diseases that, it, that they didn't have in the first place. And there still is some general um, cultural mistrust with the medical profession. And I'm wondering if some of this, and tell me if this has been your experience, Elizabeth, some stigma around seeking mental health services. Well, especially in the black community, there is a stigma because we don't want to perceive as being crazy. Okay. So we're afraid to get the help that we need because I don't want somebody to put a level me that says I'm crazy. And if that means I'm, and then I'm sorry, black folks as black people in general, I'm not trying to be stereotypical. We we don't get the services that we need because for one thing, sometimes we can't afford to pay for those services. They're so expensive. Right. No, that's a good point. So so there's a couple of things there. There's cultural mistrust. There's the stigma along with it. There's I can't afford it. Uh, right. And I think there's also like, what is this going to do? <laughs> you know, there's a thought of like, you know, you know, you you're not going to do anything or it's not going to help. But obviously from what I am hearing, there needs to be some. And one solution, and you tell me if you think that this is a good fit, Elizabeth, is I think that it might help if we had more uh, mental health professionals that were people of color that were, um, right, that you feel like you could resonate with and that were also culturally competent enough to know that I may have a, set, a different set of backgrounds that uh, determine how I approach a situation. And I think that is true. We do need to have more in the field, in particular at social work, any counseling, any of that, there's not enough of people that look like me and you. Because even myself, when I've had counseling, I felt comfortable with going to someone that looked like me because they could understand my story or what I've been through. But if I go to a system and I go somewhere and I see someone else who don't look like me, who don't even aren't even culturally competent enough to understand my story, what I've been through, who want to judge oh, oh, she just don't want to do nothing different. If I feel like you're saying that about me, I don't want to go to you either. Right. No, I totally hear that. Yay. Tia, Tia Titus is here. Can you hear me, Tia? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you see me? It's really crazy, but yeah, I'm glad to be here finally. Can you all see me? Is it? Yay! 
you don't know. I put um, sad faces and everything right. on you. I was no, I'm, 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 I'm on a Facebook Live. I don't want to miss this. Hello, how are you? Hello, Elizabeth. Right. I'm doing great, my sister. We really need to connect after this. And I think, um, first and foremost, let me just say this, y'all. I don't want to take over the call. Um, I know I'm just getting in. I just want to say, please forgive me for being so late trying to get on. I just was trying. I was in a bad area. My daughter just flew in from Florida trying to be with her. And then I was in a bad location. And I finally said, okay, you got to take me home because I have to go on this show. So nevertheless, um, I'm here. And thank you for really allowing me to you know, be on this call about the orange is not Hello. the new black because it's really so not true. the new I'm, black, okay? Yes, I can. I'm glad that you're here. So I, I want to go ahead and jump in with you, Tia. And I want you to first start off by answering the same uh, questions that I asked the other ladies earlier. And that is, tell us who you are, what is your relationship to the topic, and tell us something that you're passionate about. Okay, I am Tia Titus. I am actually an author, a speaker, a philanthropist. I don't know, I think I had to send you some stuff about me. I'm a community advocate. I am actually, my husband and I, we have a business called Help Management Services. Mm -hmm. And the help stands for helping everyone leave poverty. So that's whether it's a poverty mentality, um, not having a uh, two parent household, even though everybody is not called to be married, but it's that stability helps you from going in and out of the, the, the bars, the, the jail, the jail houses or whatever you want to call them. And um, I am really passionate about helping the, my, my focus is, are the women. My husband focuses on the men, but I know that by me being a returning citizen, I actually was, uh, I served, I only served two years, but I was actually sentenced to eight years and I was suspended all but 18 months. So out of those 18 months, I did five months there and then another bout with going in and out of the, the jail system, I did actually a year and a half. So I was able to really change my mindset. So I know I hear you were talking, I was catching little bits and pieces about the mental, uh, the mental part, the being bipolar and things of that nature, you know, I actually, my heart is dear, very, very dear to that, to, to, the, to the women mainly. And because to me, the women go through a lot more than just the men. So I just wanted to, you know, just really hone in on just that within itself. They go through a lot, you know, most of them have been, they went through a lot during their coming up, their upbringing, some been molested, some been raped. Um, like I stated, the not having the, the two parents in the household, so therefore they didn't get the guidance that they needed, you know, coming up. So no, thank that's you pretty much it until you ask me the next question. Yeah, no, thank you. So oh, tell me, what are some questions. of the common yeah. misconceptions that you're seeing as it relates to when we talk about women and incarceration? The misconceptions is that we, we as a, a per, they, they forget, number one, that we are, we are a human. That's number one. People forget, and most people that has never, and some have, they just, some have done crimes, they just didn't get caught. That's just the bottom line. So the mis misconceptions is that these people, and I say these people because that's how they really view us, as miscreants, really. They, they view us as miscreants. Um, going to continue to go back and forth and in and out of the jails, but that's to me, that's a lie. I know that's a lie because look at me, it's been actually now up into 18 years that I have not gotten in any trouble, you know. And if you have to change your mindset, of course, and that's the main thing, and that's the, the most ultimate thing that I could have done was change my mindset. So, far as the misconception, they look at us as miscreants, we're not human. Like, mm -hmm. we need to go, and, and to me, that's a myth. You're not going to continue to keep going around in that that same old stuff. That's now that is true. You have to change that mindset, though. Otherwise, you're going to get it. You're going to go through it because the stigmas that that I actually encountered was the guilt, the shame. Um, didn't want to be around people that look down upon me because I've been around that. Even when I first came on the scene with Facebook, I wouldn't even go 
I would certain people I would just let, let in my circle because I know they looked down on me. They talked about me, things like that. And until I caught the revelation and said, I was like, okay, well, these people, I'm sure that they have done some crime. They just didn't get caught. And then I know who God say who I am. He says that I am his and I might have did some crime, but now I don't have to continue to worry about that. So that that stigma is is a real is is that that the guilt and the shame is really something that hinders us if we don't wake up and realize that, hey, you got another opportunity. You got another second chance to get out here and, and, and do something different to help that next individual. My thing is. The seed reproducing after its own kind. So the seed can reproduce after its own kind. If you go back, you got to go back to pull them out. And so that's what my main focus is to help. I appreciate you sharing that. I think a a lot of what I got out of what you just said, too, is how some of that stigma can be internalized to be in shame where we could just start feeling like, you know, I'm not good enough or you you just start to believe whatever everybody else say about you, you know, and that's definitely not, not what's up. Um, Tia, tell me about yes. what are some of the trends that you're seeing as it relates to women and incarceration? Um, the trends that I've really seen now, a lot of them are starting a lot of movements. <laughs> and movements have been long as I can remember. You can take this all the way back to the Black Panthers. But I know noticed that a lot of men and women have started movements, really trying to, um, you know, change that stigma. And and I'm am one of those people that have started a movement. And I actually have a monthly telesummit every month. And I just started it in July. And the telesummit is not just to hear somebody's story. Yes, I do speak to men and women that have been incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, that now have really become the person that God has called them to be. You know, they have these businesses and something motivated them. A lot of times they've been, like you said, they've been, like I've said, rather, they've been incarcerated, but they've come out. But my thing is not just to hear their story. My thing is to start something so that that movement, a revolution, so that you can really change that stigma. And the only way to do it is us. Because we've been there. So that's one of the things that I've seen as far as the, tr- the trending. I'm trying to think of something else right now. I can't think, mm-hmm. but I do know a yeah, lot of movements have um, moved forward. So, um, Elizabeth, you talked about um, your experience with uh, drug abuse and incarceration. And now you are, you know, making, turning your mess into a message. You know what I mean? And you're helping other people transform. How did that come about? Well, you know, it, it came about it was rather funny. I, I've been blessed. Like everybody said, I've never got caught for the mess that I did. Okay. I was working in uh, the jail in Indianapolis and I started noticing that these women were celebrating being in jail. Well, I'm this typical little middle-class girl who's been blessed. And I said, well, Lord, this seems strange to me. Why are they celebrating being in jail? It didn't make sense to me. Even working in the women's prison, they still celebrate when they see one another. And that's when God said to me, he said, Elizabeth, you celebrate what you know. If that's all you know, you're going to celebrate. I said, okay, God, this makes no sense to me. And then he looked at me. He said, well, guess what? You got bars up too. Only difference is your bars aren't seen. So, you know, things started happening in my life. I turned 50. Mm-hmm. My daughter was graduating from school, and I decided I wanted to do something to better the lives of women. So that was the catalyst that made me want to change. Was I just didn't, couldn't understand why would women celebrate being in jail? So from that, I decided to start a, my own little movement of being a voice for women to help them re, you know, feel good about the woman that they were, to love on the woman in the mirror. Because I think that's, like Tia said, so many of those women that are incarcerated, they have such a low self-esteem. They don't feel as though they're good enough. But, you know, God says that we're all fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's getting us to see that that can make the difference in the world. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
before anything happens where I end up like losing you guys, I want you um, to do two things for me. And the first thing that I would like you to do is if you could talk to someone who is right now incarcerated or recently been released from being incarcerated, what sort of encouragement would you give them? What would you say? See, I actually want to add on an extra one to yours. And I want to uh, ask you to speak to some of the families who are who have loved ones who have been incarcerated and let them know how they can support their uh, family member who has been incarcerated. And then at the end of that, look at me, I'm double loading this. And at the end of that, <laughs> I want you to let people know how can they get in contact with you, whether it's your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, or what have you. So first, I want you to share with us the inspiration that you can uh, share with people who may be in that situation. And I'll lead with whoever want to take it first. No, I'm, I'm a, oh, I'm sorry. For me, well, the I, inspiration I want to leave with a sister, that you are not alone, that God is there for you, with you, and he wants you to love yourself and be the woman that he created you to because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God loves you, and you, and you have to realize that you are so much better than what you're going through right now. You're so much better, and you deserve so much more in your life. Yeah, 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 I, I agree, Elizabeth. Um, I would like to say, number one, you you must know who you are and whose you are. Um, a lot of people find God when they're incarcerated, and some don't until they get out, until they really, you know, realize that. But once you find out who you are, then you have a better chance of allowing yourself. You have to give yourself permission to go out here and do what you know that you need to do. But first, it's going to start yeah. with that crowd of people that you be around. You have to be around that crowd of people that is going to push you, that's going to um, help you get to that next dimension, because that's what you have to do. You have to get to that next dimension in your life. And so if it takes you to get a mentor, you have to find first a mentor, somebody that you can trust. Because most of us, when we get in, from out being incarcerated, we don't trust. That's that's a number one key that allows us to continuously to keep the, the recidivism going on. You keep going around in that vicious cycle because you don't want to trust that individual. But you pray and you ask God, show me who I need to get under my wing so that they can show me what I need to do so that I don't have to continuously keep going around in this vicious cycle because that's what ends up happening. So that's what the best thing that I could have done. Like I said in the beginning of this mindset. I, I, I stress that more so than anything. It was my mindset. Had I not changed my mindset, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. But then you have to, like I said, get that mentor, get a coach, get around those right people that's going to push you. A lot of times when, and, and I don't know if you read the bio in the it beginning, is. but um, yep. is it Rasheen? Is that how you pronounce your name? I hope I'm saying it right. Rasheen, okay. yep. Rasheen, I, I actually had to really, really like pull my sleeves up because I didn't know any better. No, I never dealt with any mental, mental things going on, but I was mentally in, I was, I was, I was insane <laughs> when I was going around in them vicious cycles with doing the drugs. You know, I, I used to smoke crack cocaine, but if you look at me today, I don't look that way. So I'm saying that to say, just to encourage someone, get in that right circle of people, make sure that that right um, circle of people can push you to your destiny because where everybody we have we have dreams we have aspirations we have things that we want to do in life and for the life of it we just don't know how so sometimes you got to get that right person to show you what you need to do and to the, the answer the, the the next question in regards to the family members you just have to be supportive you have to give them the that individual the support mechanisms I mean, a lot of times they might have hurt you. You have unforgiveness in your heart. You're going to have to somewhere shape down in the inside of you, pull it out and give that individual that opportunity to show. 
Because it, it, if, if God give you a second chance, why can't a family member can? So, you know, and, and a lot of times I still, my family to be to this day, and being so all of the accomplishments that I've had, I still don't get the accolades that I, I would want or I think I should have. But I had to get to my to a point in my life, and I was like, you know what? As long as I got the right circle of people and the right circle of friends that's gonna push me where I need to be, sure, the family members can be there, but I do know that your family, really, to be honest with you, yes. comes that yes. family outside your family. Seriously, I'm just keeping it real. Yeah. Yeah. Real. Now tell me, tell so everyone. I just wanted to say, um, how can we get in contact with you? Go ahead. Can, I'll ask Elizabeth first. How can we reach out to you if somebody wants to connect? If you want to connect, I have a Facebook page, which is Elizabeth Artiback, me. Then also Women Reaching Out has a page called Women Reaching Out on Facebook. You can go there and you can find information about us as well also. Fantastic. And you, Tia? Okay. Um, you can go to uh, my um, fan page, which is help management services. Um, you can click on that. You can leave a message if you need to. Um, I'm also on Facebook as Tia Tenacious Titus um, on Twitter as the joy enthusiast. And let me tell you how enthusiast is spelled. And that's E N T H U S E S T. And let me first, and, and, and as you know, we, 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 we keep, we keep, we're supposed to keep our brand all together and consistent and all that stuff. I'm with that. I understand that. I get that. But I am a joy enthusiast because God gave me that name due to the fact that I am a breast cancer survivor. So I, and I changed it because the other hashtag was called help manage one. And I was like, God, I'm not feeling this. I'm not feeling this. So anyway, I changed that. So that's why it's a little different. You can also go to Instagram. My Instagram is Tia Titus, just by itself. And that's pretty much it. So, because all of this stuff, they got Snapchat. Oh, oh, what is it? Snap, Snapchat or whatever. And that's just too much, y'all. I'm, I'm serious. It's just too much. But you have to get out there from a social media standpoint. And if that's what it takes, so be it. But I'm going to tell you, I haven't graduated to that yet. I'm just now getting used to the Twitter and the Instagram. And then they got all this other stuff, okay? But that's how you get in contact with me. And also my website. You can reach me also on my website, which is tiatitis.com. And on my website is my book. Um, the name of my book is Unexplainable Joy, My Triumphant Route with Breast Cancer. So if you go on there, I'll really um, hit you back. I'm very keen on getting back in touch with me. I'm not a procrastinator when it comes to that. Awesome. And so in other words, I'm a good follow upper. So um, I also see uh, Stephanie, uh, my fantastic co-host, is in the audience from another show. Stephanie, if you could put in the chat the next show coming up on hers, mine, and yours. Um, and anybody who wants to get in contact with me, you can reach me at srashim.com on Twitter. It's srashim. On Instagram, it's srashim. And on Snapchat, it is srashim. Um, on Fire Talk, it is firetalk.com forward slash Rasheem. And the next segment is of the counter narrative is race, politics, and social justice and social justice. That is going to be October 1st at 9 30 p.m. Eastern Time. Again, this has been the counter narrative. This segment is um, Orange is not the new black race, gender, and incarceration. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Tia. Um, Natira is not here right now, but I thank and appreciate her. There's a show this coming Thursday called Hers, Mine, and Yours, and that will be at 9.30 Eastern time. You'll more than likely like it. It'll be myself as well as Stephanie co-hosting. We're both co-hosting it. And so join us there. So I am going to go ahead and wrap it up and just thank you so much again for sharing your stories, your lived experiences, your insight, your advice, your wisdom. If there's anything that I could do to support and share more information, Stephanie says great topic and great information. Thank you. Thank you. 1000 times. Thank you. Thank and you. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. 
And thank you for joining me. And and know that I have a that that show that reentry teleassignment is going to be on the um, October the tenth through the fourteenth. You would want not to miss that one. It's going to be some power of people on there. Awesome. That's going to really thank help you the so much. Good night, ladies. As well. Good night. Good night. Good night.